Bible, if you turn to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, son of Halakha, in the month of Kivish, on the twelfth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanai, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the providence are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. With Jesus' resurrection from the grave over, he has risen. We celebrated his resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. Jesus and the disciples spent the next 40 days together, and he spent much of that time teaching and encouraging the disciples for what was to come. And then in Acts chapter 1, we are told they followed Jesus out to near the town of Bethany. Now some translations say they was out on the Mount of Olives, but they were out near the town of Bethany, and there he blessed them and gave them the authority to preach the good news. Then he ascended into the clouds to sit at the right hand of God. And after his ascension, they returned to the upper room. But it also says in the scriptures that they worship daily at the temple. And while they were gathered in the upper room, the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, Peter, filled with the Spirit, stood and spoke to the multitudes concerning Christ. In fact, Scripture said that 3,000 came to know the Lord that day. And from that point on, from the time Jesus ascended into the glories of heaven, things changed. They pushed the restart button, and they begin the process of changing the world for Jesus Christ. Now that reset button on many things are important. We've been out of without heat and water, hot water, for about two weeks. Our furnace broke down because of improper installation, we found out later. Uh, and so they came and they fixed it. But in the meantime, sometimes I can go down and hit the restart button, and it might fire, and it might not. And finally it got to the point where it just wouldn't start anymore. No matter how many times you push that button, there was enough wrong with inside the combustion chambers, the carburetor as they call it, that it would never fire. Well, all that happened in those 40 days from Jesus' resurrection until he ascended into the glories of heaven, the disciples pushed the restart button. And they begin to share the gospel message that would change the world and is still changing the world today. But in the book of Nehemiah, we find a similar story. Men who had returned from a trip to Jerusalem were questioned by Nehemiah about how things in the city were going, what was happening. And the report that given to him by these men was not a positive one. The temple had been rebuilt, but the walls were still in disrepair. The city gates had been burned, and the enemy could easily enter the gates if they decided to attack the city. Upon hearing this report, Nehemiah sat down and he worshiped. And that we're going to talk about next week in verse 4. So if you want to read ahead and do a little research, you're certainly welcome to do that. For those of you who know little about Nehemiah, he was the official cupbearer for King Architect Architexes. 
that meant that he tasted the drinks and the food before the king ate or drank. In case it was poison, he would be the one to die and the king would live on. But he was also like an advisor to the king. And when he was asked why he was sad, as you go on and read down through that first chapter, Nehemiah told him it was because his beloved city still lay in ruins. And so the king, with a letter of authority, sent Nehemiah back to Jerusalem to get started rebuilding the city. In other words, he went back and he pushed restart. We're going to build this city up. We're going to build the walls up. When Nehemiah arrived, he set in place his plans to rebuild the walls. And like Nehemiah, when we begin to rebuild our lives, we need to start right. For those of you who have remodeled or rebuilt buildings or remodeled things in your house, you know how important it is to start right. Rebuilders can get started right by, first of all, making an honest evaluation. In other words, what do we need? What do we want to do? How do we want to fix it? How do we want it to look? Secondly, identify the needs. Okay, we need 14 two by fours. We need some plywood. We need some sheetrock. We need a bunch of nails and screws. We need paint and mud. We take a personal responsibility. Okay, this is what I can do. I can do this. I can destroy it, but I can't fix it. So then we do an evaluation. Okay, I need to hire a carpenter. And then fourth, we need to move out of our comfort zone. Most of you are aware that it's hard to find a carpenter nowadays to come in and do your work. They are so busy that it's, it's hard for them to do so. So maybe you need to step out of your comfort zone and learn how to put up sheetrock or learn how to, to mud or paint or decorate. That's all of the process that takes place as we learn to rebuild our homes, our facilities that we want to, we want to change. So let's start with the first step, and that is to make an honest evaluation. As we mentioned earlier, Nehemiah received from those who had just returned from Jerusalem the condition of the city, and he was saddened by what he heard. And so as he contemplated his moves, he looked at the facts, a small remnant, had returned to Jerusalem, and they had rebuilt the temple, not in its former glory, but they had rebuilt it enough so that they could worship God. But the walls were still down. The gates had been burned and would not keep out the enemy if they was attacked. And while some things were getting back to normal, they was able to worship, but they had no protection. All was not right. Those who had returned had dishonored God by kind of falling away from worshiping God. Maybe they were dabbling with some idol worship or just wasn't going to church at all. Or going to the temple, I should say, in our day it would be going to church. So all was not right. They had dishonored God and neglected the temple in keeping it up and, and making it according to God's rules and, and regulations. And so Nehemiah begins by examining the facts. First of all, the walls were broken and in need to be rebuilt to provide a place of safety and security for the residents of the city. And secondly, was to rebuild or replace the city gates so that if they were attacked, the enemy could not enter into the city without great loss of, of men. Now, I want you to think about this. Many of us falter and fail when we have to rebuild our lives. We don't take the time to make a careful evaluation of our circumstances and situations. And it's hard to get ourselves to the place of admitting our needs, our needs of tearing down our walls and burning our gates 
that we use to shut out God. Think about those men and women who ignore the physical signs that something's wrong physically with them. But they will not go to a doctor to have it checked out until it's too late. And if we're going to rebuild our lives spiritually, we must start with an honest evaluation of our lives. What does God want me to do? What, what do I need to change? What needs to be done to bring glory to God and to make me a better follower of Christ? We start with an honest evaluation of our lives. And we will find at least three things that we need to seek when we try to rebuild our lives. And one of the ways that we often try to rebuild our lives is known as superficial optimistic. The focus is on the superficial. These are people who are constantly trying to put a positive attitude when in difficult situations. All too often, we try to convince ourselves that there's not a problem. I'm doing okay. I'm fine. As Dr. David Jeremiah said in one of these little info commercials, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. So we try to convince ourselves that everything is okay and we try to put a positive attitude when we find ourselves in a difficult situation. We will try almost anything to keep from admitting that there is a problem. And we hope that if we ignore it, it will go away or it will work out itself. And all too often we repeat the words that Jeremiah chapter 8 wrote, verse 11, peace, peace when there is no peace. We try to convince ourselves that everything is okay when we're in trouble, when we have an issue, spiritually, physically, emotionally. We try to fix it ourselves, and it don't always work. Secondly, some are what we might call busy optimists. They admit that there's a problem, and they try all they can do to get others to be a part of their problems. They do all they can to have new ideas, new positive thinking personnel to aid in trying to fix the problem. And all the while they never get around to taking an honest evaluation or addressing the problem in their lives. That's when they form a committee. We're gonna make a study of it to see what our issue is. And sometimes it is these issues in this area that often causes churches to split or people to leave the church. They're not willing to address the problem openly. They don't want to hear it because that's not my way. They bring on all kinds of new programs, new staff, new approaches, but unless they plug the holes, fix the spiritual problem, the emotional, the physical problem, that ship will not stay afloat. This concept also applies to us as individuals as well. If we're not willing to take an honest look at our spiritual issues in our lives, we'll not have a right relationship with God. And without a right relationship with God, many of our issues will only get worse. And we become discouraged as we find as we study through part of Nehemiah, we'll find that the people had become discouraged because they weren't looking at it and making an honest evaluation of their issues and their problems. But Nehemiah, in these few first chapter, verses of chapter 1, also shows us the best way to deal with our problems. By making an honest evaluation of our lives, we might call them honest optimists. These are the people who have the strength and the patience as well as the wisdom and understanding to address their problems somatically and then work hard to correct the problems. Sometimes that means we might offend others. Who others may reject us. People may turn away from you because you don't agree with them. Those who make an honest attempt to rectify the problem 
will not only be formed and fashioned, will not be formed and fashioned by the way that others think or say. In other words, we know the difference between right and wrong, and we're going to follow wrong or right, even though the world is following the wrong direction. And the same thing is true in our spiritual walk as well. We know what's right. We know what God wants. We know what God's will is. And we're willing to take that stand and stand with God rather than follow the ways of the world. And maybe that's where you're at right now. You're in need of rebuilding a relationship with God or with someone else. Willing to rebuild a life starting a fresh, starting new. You need a rebuilding relationship with God. And so you begin by making an honest evaluation of your life, but have never made or taken that step of admitting your need to make changes in your life. In the past, maybe you took the optimistic approach, the superficial approach, simply dealing with the surface issues, all while crying out, peace, peace, but you have no peace. Or you have chosen the busy optimistic style. Instead of dealing with the issues, we cover it up. We cover the problems. We circumvent the problems with curt replies and actions. Oh, I'm doing fine. Don't worry about me. I'll be okay. When inside, we're hurting, we're falling apart spiritually, physically, emotionally. And we don't realize how those three are intertwined with one another. One affects the other in some way or another. So that's why it's important that we take an honest look at our lives. The best is to learn from Nehemiah to make our honest evaluation of our lives. Nehemiah inquired, he learned, he admitted that there was a problem that could only be fixed by looking at the situation with an open mind. Okay, the walls are down, there's no protection. People are walking away from God, they're not doing what God wants them to do. What are we going to do to fix the problem? So he makes a list, if you will. Rebuild the walls. Fix the gates. Bring people back to, to God and to worship Him. And as you we look down through the chapters of Nehemiah's life, we'll find he takes these steps one at a time and he begins to rebuild the walls. In fact, if you read over several chapters, you'll find that they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. Amazing. Considering some of these blocks weighed hundreds of thousands of pounds that they had to lift manually by hand and set one on top of the other. So as you read and study Nehemiah, I hope you question yourself with some hard questions. Is this, is there any unfinished business that I need to take care of? Are there walls that need to be rebuilt and gates hung to keep the enemy out? As we examine our lives, we need to be honest with our questions. David said it best when he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me into the way everlasting. Honest evaluation of our lives. Are we in tune with God? Are we doing God's will? And if not, what do we need to change? What do we need to do to bring us back into God's will? Those are the hard questions that we need to ask ourselves as we make an honest evaluation of our lives. As David learned, and so can we, that when it comes to revitalization, that it's never too late for a new beginning. There's always time to start over and to rebuild our lives and to walk in that path that God has for us and to be in the center of God's will. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you.
that you're a God of patience, that you're a God who cares about our lives, what we say, what we do, how we live, our witness to those around us. And in those times when our life seems to be falling apart, when our walls have tumbled down and our gates have been burned and allows the enemy, allows Satan to come in and begin to distract us from worshiping you. Help us, Father, to take the honest approach, the honest evaluation of our lives and question ourselves and have God search our hearts and make us aware of the needs that we have physically, spiritually, emotionally, and then what we need to do to bring our lives back in conformity to your will. And through that, then we can continue to witness of God's love and mercy in our lives. Thank you, Father, for your spirit who comes into our lives and convicts us of the importance of walking in your way and in your will. And as you minister to us through your spirit, Father, we give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll take your hymnals, please, and turn to number 408, number 408.